Welcome to the deep dive. Ever think about how natural gas actually gets ready for, you know, your home? It's not just straight from the ground, is it? Not at all. Today, we're looking at a really key step, cleaning it up. Yeah. Getting rid of stuff like hydrogen sulfide, that rotten egg smell, HUROs and carbon dioxide, cobalt. I hate the sour gas component. Exactly. And you, our listener, sent over some great info notes and a diagram on something called amine treating. So that's our mission today. Yeah, let's unpack how this amine treating works step by step and really why it's so important. It's kind of like a detox process for the gas. Makes sense. Okay, yeah. so the materials point to the amine treating unit. It looks like the first major piece of equipment is the absorber. Uh, what's its job? Well, the absorber is really where the main action starts. You've got this tall tower. Okay. And the raw natural gas, the sour gas, it gets fed into the very bottom of this tower. And it travels upwards. It travels up, exactly. Okay. And coming down from the top, flowing against it, is this liquid solution called lean amine. Lean amine. Okay, so lean means it's clean, ready to work. Precisely. Think of the AMI molecules as uh, like tiny chemical sponges. They're specifically designed to grab onto HUROs and COO. Ah, I see. So as the sour gas bubbles up through the tower, it makes contact with this falling lean amine. And the amine just snatches those unwanted gases out. It reacts chemically, yeah. It latches onto the HUROs and COOs, absorbing them. What comes out at the bottom isn't lean amine anymore. It's rich amine. Rich because it's loaded up with the stuff we don't want. Exactly. Loaded with those acid gases. Now, the notes you shared mentioned the conditions inside. Temperature, uh, 35 to 50 degrees C. That seems fairly moderate. Yeah, relatively cool for industrial processes. But the pressure, wow, 5 to 205 atmospheres, that's a huge range. Why so wide? Well, that just shows you how adaptable the process has to be, you know? Natural gas sources aren't all the same. Right. Some wells might be high pressure, others much lower. Exactly. So the absorber has to handle whatever pressure the incoming gas is at. And once the amine's done its work... The clean gas comes out the top. Yep. That's your sweet gas, basically purified natural gas, ready for the next step. Okay, so we've got sweet gas, but now we have this rich amine full of HRS and CoO. We can't just, like, dunk that, can we? Oh, definitely not. That would be wasteful and environmentally problematic. Mm -hmm. Plus, the amine itself is valuable. So you need to clean it. That's where the second big piece comes in, the regenerator, sometimes called a stripper. Regenerator. Yeah. Makes sense it regenerates the amine. How does that work? So the rich amine gets pumped from the absorber, usually through a heat exchanger first to warm it up a bit, yeah. and then it goes into the top of the regenerator tower. Okay, another tower. And what happens inside this one? Heat. Heat is key, yes. Yeah. Steam is usually injected into the bottom of the regenerator. Ah, okay. This heats the rich amine solution flowing down. We're talking higher temperatures here, like 115 to 126 Celsius down at the bottom. And the pressure is lower. The notes say 1.4 to 1.7 atmospheres. Much lower pressure, yes. Yeah. And that combination of higher temperature and lower pressure, yeah. it does something crucial. It breaks the connection between oh. the amine and the bad gases. Exactly. It reverses the absorption reaction that happened in the absorber. The heat gives the HROs and CoUro molecules enough energy to break free from the amine. So the gases are released. Where do they go? They travel up and exit the top of the regenerator as a concentrated stream of acid gas. This gas mixture then usually goes through a condenser. To cool it down. Right. Cools it, and some of it turns back into liquid. This collects in what's called a reflux drum. And I saw a note about reflux being sent back. Why send some back into the regenerator? It sounds a bit strange, maybe, but sending some of that condensed liquid, the reflux, back to the top of the regenerator actually helps improve the separation. It sort of washes down any amine that might try to escape with the acid gases, boosts efficiency. Clever. So the acid gases are removed at the top. What about the amine? The amine, now stripped of the HROs and CoHero, collects at the bottom of the regenerator. It's hot, but it's clean again. It's lean amine again. It's lean amine again, so it gets cooled down, often exchanging heat with the rich amine going into the regenerator to save energy, and then it's pumped right back to the top of the absorber. Just start the whole process over. Exactly. It's a continuous loop. The amine just keeps circulating, absorbing in one tower, and releasing or regenerating in the other. That's really efficient, a closed loop system. It has to be, for cost and environmental reasons. So, yeah, key takeaway. You need both the absorber and the regenerator working together. One captures the impurities, the other releases them and cleans the amine for reuse. And the main energy input is that steam for the regenerator. That's the main utility cost, yeah. Heating things up to break those bonds.
but it's essential. Removing corrosive AGRO protects pipelines, and removing coero improves the heating value of the gas. Okay, let me see if I've got this straight. Sour gas in the bottom of the absorber, lean amine down from the top. They meet. Amine grabs the HROs and co -ero. Sweet gas leaves the top. Rich amine goes to the regenerator. <laughs> Heat and steam are applied, forcing the HROs and co -ero off the amine. Aye. As a gas leaves the top. Check. And the now lean amine collects at the bottom, ready to go back to the absorber. You've nailed it. That's the core cycle of alimanine treating. It's a fundamental chemical engineering process that makes a huge difference to the energy we rely on. It really makes you think, doesn't it? About all these like invisible industrial processes running constantly just to make modern life function. Absolutely. What other critical things are happening you know, behind the scenes that ensure the quality or safety of things we use every day without a second thought? Something to chew on. Thanks for breaking that down. My pleasure. It's fascinating stuff.